and welcome to Royals at the Ranch for Thursday, March 3rd, 2022. I am Lori with Behavior Education at Spirit Keeper Equine Sanctuary. And one of my Royals actually did wake up and come out of her enclosure this evening so that she could help me with this introduction. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's not why she came out, but she's out, so she's going to be in the introduction with me. This is Pavlo. This is Pavlova. She is a female blackhead python regis who was hatched on July 31st, 2021. She came from alien heads and head stamps. And I'm thrilled with her. She's a pretty outgoing royal. She comes out most nights. She's not that amenable to handling as most snakes aren't. In fact, that's one of the topics in today's episode. In this episode, I'm going to show you some enclosure ideas for your Royal Pythons. We're going to have a behavior break, which talks about whether or not your Royal Pythons are actually social and like being touched. The video got pretty long, so there's not going to be a Royals in your home segment this week, but I promise that we'll get back to that next week. Here's an example of what something might look like that I use as an initial quarantine tub for a Royal. As you see, I've got the hatchling tub inside this one, and that hatchling tub has water in it, it has a hide in it, it's got a perch in it, it's got paper towel down there, and it's got a rock in it. Then there's a hole on top that the snake can go in and out of, and if the little baby royal never wanted to come out of there, he or she wouldn't need to. But if they want to, they've got this larger habitat to start investigating and start getting used to that can help transition them to when I want to put them in a habitat. And so I don't have substrate in this one yet because this snake is still in quarantine. So I actually just have towels down there and I've got mostly plastic stuff in here. I've got a sky hide. I have got PVC perching. I've got enrichment items. I've got a water dish that they can also get underneath and it doubles as a hide. And then I've got another plastic hide here, a humid hide there, a rock. And you see here, this Royal, this is Gunji. He's up here next to his heat mat because it's nighttime. And I turn off the overhead halogen and UVB and there's a heat mat on the side if they need any night heat. He doesn't always use that, but I see he's using it now. And this is a 40 inch long by 20 inch deep by 18 inch high tub that I've converted into just a really nice quarantine enclosure and it works really well for Royal Pythons. Now let's take a look at a similar tub that I would say is the next step up. This snake is still in quarantine, but she's past the point where she needs to be on paper towels or towels and she can have some substrate and some additional enrichment items. Here's an example of an intermediate enclosure or even an enclosure that you could keep a royal in until they get bigger. This is a quarantine tub, but this snake has been here long enough that she has defecated and urinated and I've seen that that all looks normal and there's no mites present and things like that. And so I still have it pretty simply um, laid out. I've still got a lot of plastic in here and just some fake foliage, but I do have added substrate. So I've got aspen in one part of it, and I've got cypress mulch that can get moist around the end that's got the water. And then there is a halogen on top, and I have a UVB light bar inside. So Again, this is a good example of something that could be an intermediate step from initial quarantine to before they're in a regular enclosure, or you could just keep making this more intricate and adding more to it the longer the snake's here. And as long as the snake hasn't outgrown this, there's no reason you couldn't use something like these for a regular habitat. 
Hello everyone, welcome to this behavior break. I have a couple of questions for you that I'm gonna try and help answer. Number one, is your Royal Python social? Question number two, do Royal Pythons like being touched? Let's try and answer these questions and let's look to science to help inform us. Animals in general may be social, selectively social, or not social at all. Let's talk about what that means. So who's innately social? This is gonna vary by species. It's gonna vary within a species because you're always gonna have outliers. So you may have a species in general that's extremely social, and you might have a few individuals who just don't want anything to do with others. I can name a few humans like that. You might also have a species that in general is very solitary, but you might have one individual that does like being with others. While it's gonna vary by species and within a species, it's also going to vary with each individual. And I think we're gonna see that more under captive management, that this could vary with individuals than we might see in nature. Let's talk about some different species and whether they're social, selectively social, or not social at all. And this is again in general. Cats are generally selectively social. Some cats are extremely social with people and their conspecifics and others are not. And even with their own kind, they tend to form social bonds with certain other cats and not with others. They can live a solitary life or they can live with a group. Dogs tend to be social. Wild dogs, wild canid species, wolves tend to live in social groups. Horses are a very social animal, and that goes for most hoofstock, most ungulates. They live in herds, they live in groups. Their lifestyle is really revolving around their social structure. Snakes, not so much. Snakes are typically not social. Of course, there are a few species we know to be exceptions, but in general, snakes just are not social. That means they're not social with each other outside of reproduction, and they're certainly not social with other species. And then elephants are another example of a species in general that's highly social. They live in family groups, and the family dynamic is very important to them. Let's talk a little bit about touch. And by touch, I mean physical contact from conspecifics or other animals. I don't mean touching inanimate objects, things that aren't alive. So many snakes, for example, are not comfortable being touched by people or by other living things, but they're okay being touched by inanimate objects like branches, like perches, like even snake hooks if they've had no aversive experiences with them before. So it can be easy to pick them up with an inanimate object as an intermediate step before we actually touch them with our hands. Do snakes like to be touched by others? Generally, they don't. With the exception of like rattlesnakes and garter snakes, snakes generally aren't social. At best, they kind of just tolerate each other and ignore each other. And then at worst, some species actually eat each other. They're not a species that likes to be touched by others of their own kind or by other animals in general. And there's a reason for that. The most recent edition of Mater's Reptile and Amphibian Medicine and Surgery informs us that in nature, direct restraint is usually closely tied to consumption by a predator. So handling as a stressor of reptiles is not surprising. Handling leads to increases in both corticosterone and adrenal catecholamines, even in some reptiles that are habituated to people. So in the wild, being touched by another organism generally means you are going to be eaten. And so snakes are innately not comfortable with being touched. It's just their nature. It's the way that they are. These are things that you need to remember when we are talking about snakes as family members and interacting with our snakes. It is not normal for snakes to seek contact with others outside of reproduction, except for species we know to be social like garter snakes and rattlesnakes. Snakes in captivity are inherently distressed by being touched by people, and they must be gradually desensitized to accept it. 
some come to accept it very well, some come to just tolerate it, and some just never really come to be comfortable and relaxed with human contact. Other living things touching them is usually bad for wild snakes because it means they're being predated upon. It means they're going to be eaten and killed. So it is just not normal for things to touch them and for snakes to be comfortable with that. Many snakes can learn to not fear being touched by others and to tolerate it, but some may never habituate to it. In some cases, snakes who learn to trust people may find proximity and physical contact with humans reinforcing. Once they're not afraid of us anymore, once they're used to us being around, once we've gradually worked them up to some touching and handling, some snakes actually may find it reinforcing to be near humans and they may actually seek out attention from us. I think that that's rare. I only have a couple of snakes that actually come towards me and seek out interaction with me and any physical contact. Most of them see me as a source of, of resources like food and water and a means to get out of their enclosure and exercise. Some see me as a means to transport them from one location to another, something to climb on to get from point A to point B. And most of the time, if given the choice, they're going to move away from me. There are a couple of exceptions. Our super dwarf reticulated python, TC, is one of those exceptions. He's actually right here next to me now. And he's a huge exception because he usually seeks to come out most every night and he actually seeks interaction sometimes with people. And that's not normal. You notice there's not a royal out right now because none of them are awake yet. It's about 11 p.m. and they're still all um, asleep. There's a couple that are starting to move around, but TC's been awake for several hours and he actually came out of his enclosure by choice a few hours ago. And just now he moved from the other side of the room to come over here to climb on me and interact with me. He's one of the exceptions in my family of snakes that actually seems friendly and seeks human interaction. It's not the norm. Snakes are innately fearful and defensive of being touched. If you have any questions about this, you want more resources about snake social behavior and the distress that it can potentially cause them if they're overhandled, please feel free to email me at behaviorucationllc at gmail.com. You can join our Patreon group where we have monthly discussions a couple of times a month and where I have regular office hours. Or you can contact me through my website at behavioreducation.org as well as on all of the normal social media outlets like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Thank you so much for your interest in snake behavior, training, welfare, and enrichment. Until next time, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals. This is an enclosure I like to show. If you're going to use a glass terrarium for your Royal Python, I really like this style. It's front opening, but it has the option to also open from the top. And I'm able to put a halogen and UVB lamps on one half, and I'm actually able to cover the other half with plastic to help keep moisture in, because on this side of the enclosure, I keep it pretty wet. I've got sphagnum moss as substrate on this side, and I've got a cork bark buried in it, and then I've got a double water container. That's drinking water, and I have it sitting in another container, and I always overflow the drinking water. And so the snake's able to crawl around in that half of the enclosure in the moss, in the log, um, in this little moat that's outside the drinking water. And then of course I've got foliage and perches on this side. And then in the middle, there is the basking area that's right under the halogen during the day and that rock heats up and then there's a moss box. And then under the moss box, there's a hide. I've got aspen on this side in case the snake wants a dry area. I've got another rock here, another cork bark there, um, another rock here, and then a ledge, more fake foliage. And I have a heat mat on the side here for night heat if the snake needs it. And this particular enclosure, I've got the back 
covered. So it is all glass, but I have something across the back. And then of course, there's so much inside that the snake's able to move around all parts of the enclosure without feeling like they're vulnerable, without feeling like they're out in the open and they don't have a place where they can immediately get into and hide. And so there's no reason why you couldn't keep increasing the size of an enclosure of this type and using it for bigger and bigger snakes if this is a style that you like. I really like this style. And this snake, the particular snake that's in here, Kenobi, is just doing really, really well in this enclosure. And these are examples of Royals and PVC enclosures. I'm not gonna probably open these because I see the snakes are out in an ambush position, but they also can do very well in PVC enclosures. Um, I can open this side of this one to show you. This is Romana and this is a three by two by two and it's black box cages. So obviously it, as she gets bigger, I will be able to keep her in this exact same enclosure, but I could get her a four by two by two, a five by two by two, a six by two by two, depending on how big she gets. And I could set it up identical to how this one is set up. So she really wouldn't have any change other than it would be more space for her. She's got Aspen in half and she's got Cypress mulch in half. I usually like to put something around the water dish that's okay to get wet. And then I just put lots of stuff in there because you never know what type of personality your Royal is going to have. And they could be climbers or they could be terrestrial. They could feel very confident out in the open or they could really need a lot of debris and hiding places to feel comfortable moving around the enclosure. And so I just really like to give them options. This one down here is Phoenix's. It's been in other videos. She is pretty much all the way transitioned and settled in, but I still have her hatchling tub in here and it's still fully, fully furnished. And she does use it when she goes into blue. And since she uses it at some portion of her cycle, I just leave it there. It doesn't harm me at all. It doesn't hurt me at all to keep water in there and sphagnum moss in there and to keep that available to her because she uses it when she's going to shed. And the rest of the time, she uses the rest of the enclosure. She really likes this humid hide that's right here. Um, I don't see her basking a lot on these rocks. It's They're right under her halogen. I see her in her humid hide or sitting right on top of her humid hide a lot. And then she has a UVB light bar here. And then she's just got cork bark and other um, fake foliage, things to climb on. She's really been using this elevated cave a lot lately. And then she's got an elevated sky hide there and perching. So Royals really have the ability to do well in a lot of various enclosures as long as you accommodate the individual snake's personality and you make sure that they have access to all of the resources that they need in order to thrive. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, everybody, please remember to always be kind and love your animals.